Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so, like I said before, we uh, before I start with, um, uh, with with the presentation and introduction of our speakers, uh, I think at this point, while waiting for some more people to come in, we can just have a very quick because I like to have this meeting relatively informal. Uh, but uh, maybe a very very short introduction who we have around the table. Uh, and I'll start from there coming down here. Sean. Yeah, I'm Sean. I work with Model um, Information Systems Officer. Hi, I'm Alexander Loschke. I also work with Rommel in the data innovation and capacity branch on different things. I'm the second Sean, Sean de Boer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, the director of uh, Central Bureau of Statistics, Kyrsa. Uh, I'm Sen Zhang, technical specialist, uh, uh, UNFPA headquarters, technical division. Okay. André Laranger, uh, Statistics Canada, uh, responsible for economic statistics. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul McLeod, technical specialist, uh, Osama Rahman, Director of the Data Science Campus at the Office for National Statistics. So, Ken, my sister, Simon Fraser University. Um, this is the number one speaker. Yes. So, Ronald Jensen, United Nations Statistics Division. I'm leading the data innovation uh, and, uh, and capacity branch, and I will say more about uh, what we do in a second. In the task, uh, and I'm part of the call to open minds um, and participate in the United Nations Privacy and Technology Lab. Please. I'm Lizzie Trump, I work with Hector. Hi. Hello, I'm Lizzie Trump, I work with Hector. Hi, Director of Integration, Analysis, and Research at the United Nations. Please have a seat. Oh. If you just uh, can say who, uh, who you are. Uh, I'm Yuna, you must have uh, I belong to I belong to Japan National Statistics Center. Okay, thank you. Hi, morning, everyone. And we should announce over there. I'm the Director General of the Statistical Institute of Japan. Natalie Simpson, Director of Surveys at Stati. Soko Vako, United Nations Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific. Abdullah uh, Ghazal, Brown's Branch, State Innovation Capacity Building, UNSD. Hi, good morning, Rifat Hussain, uh, World Health Organization. I leave the data and evidence for health and migration. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thanks, thanks for coming here this early on a uh, <coughs> morning. Um, what we like to discuss today is um, access to sensitive data in general uh, and how we could going forward try to um, to improve uh, access to data specifically also sharing of data between institutes this could be at national level could be internationally so that more value is taken out of the availability of data uh, so that's that's where we have been working on um, within the um, the context of, uh, of this committee of experts on big data, data science specifically, and the task team on privacy and technologies. Okay, before I go there, um, I will I actually have it on the slide. I will indicate what our, our um, program for this morning is. So if we go to the next uh, slide. So we, we work in the context under the Statistical Commission uh, with the Committee of Experts on Data and Data Science. Uh, that committee was established about 10 years ago and it has many groups working under it. Uh, a number of the task teams are working on specific uh, detailed uh, big data. But what we also needed uh, to work together on, uh, on microdata, uh, to get access to microdata also at national or international level, is a, a group that would uh, look into uh, how we, we uh, can preserve privacy uh, while uh, accessing data, as accessing microdata or sharing microdata or disseminating microdata. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Sean. Yep, oh, that's small. Uh, <laughs> 
So I will give a, a, a short uh, introduction to set the stage uh, about what we are discussing uh, uh, here today and um, what could be uh, some of the work going forward. Uh, we will have uh, presentations from uh, Andrew, Sojin, and, and Massimo, who is uh, uh, calling in from, uh, from Italy. And then uh, hope to have uh, quite a bit of time for, um, for a discussion. Um, so let me introduce. So Andrew has been leading within the uh, task team on privacy enhancing technologies, uh, where we discuss uh, both the techniques uh, but also legal aspects of using uh, those tools to um, to preserve or uh, enhance the, uh, uh, the the privacy aspects of data. Uh, we have within that uh, task team also a, uh, a so-called uh, a pet lab, privacy and technologies uh, lab, which um, looks on on a very practical level about how we can uh, use tools for to develop them. Uh, and, and all kinds of aspects of that. And Andrew Trask, who is, uh, and, uh, you can say more about that uh, later on, but who is on one hand a uh, researcher associated or, uh, with the uh, University of Oxford, but he is foremost known for us as the leader of uh, Open Mind, uh, which has been working in this space of, uh, of privacy. Uh, technologies uh, for, uh, for quite a while. Um, they're doing currently also work directly with some statistical offices in Latin America. And I would like to hear more about that. Then I have with us here Sujin. Uh, Sujin Kim, she's uh, with the um, Simon Fraser University mm -hmm. of, uh, in Vancouver, uh, working in the area of, uh, of genomics data in public health. And uh, she will say more about that. So she is also working with us already quite a while uh, in this context of the uh, Committee of Experts. Uh, she's been working more earlier on uh, on the training side uh, and uh, since a couple of years now also in the uh, privacy and technology. Uh, uh, and then thirdly, we'll have a presentation by uh, Massimo, Massimo de Kubelitz. He uh, is with uh, ISTAD and we can see him there uh, uh, on the left, it is rather small, but we'll see you bigger <laughs> later on, uh, Massimo. Uh, I know you can hear us, so that's good. Uh, he's with ESA, the Statistical Office of Italy, uh, and they've been uh, working uh, both at, at European level, uh, but also uh, uh, globally, um, but trying to see how uh, data could be shared between statistical offices. Um, so first of all, that those projects, and, and Massimo will say more about it, um, is, uh, is not done directly with the sensitive data, but the ultimate goal is to see if uh, microdata with sensitive information can be shared between offices, which currently is really difficult. Okay, then we have time for discussion. Go to the next slide. Still very small. Um, so the, um, the goal of what our group is trying to do is um, uh, is unlocking value of data sharing. So the, the premises on which we work is that there is a lot of value uh, in microdata that currently uh, is not being used because it's so difficult to either combine uh, data sets uh, between institutes um, or make data available to third parties uh, who you like to work with um, and, and so forth. So um, enabling data sharing would add significant value uh, for society in the end, right? So that is the, uh, the second premise that we have, but we need to, to protect privacy, right? So that's something that um, statistical officers take very seriously because they would like to maintain, they need to maintain public trust in the work that they do. So there is the, uh, the balance between getting more benefit out of data uh, with the uh, keeping public trust in the work that statistical officers particularly are doing. So access modalities, so this, this um, getting access to privately held data, that's one of the topics that's uh, also 
more and more to the fore uh, in, uh, in recent years. So getting access, for instance, to mobile phone data has been for a number of statistical officers uh, uh, that they would like to get access, but privacy concerns uh, have been a major issue. The same with like credit card data, payment card data, and things like that. Uh, and then there is sharing of data between institutes. Um, for some of the global issues, sharing data between countries, for instance, would be very useful, like during the health pandemic, right? Could we share more data uh, on, uh, on COVID-19 in uh, cases that were, were in various countries? Um, also, even within a country, uh, sharing data between the central bank and the statistical office, is, uh, some of these cases that there are, is, is not as easy as it sounds. And then disseminating, disseminating uh, microdata to the public. Um, so this could also, to the public, can also mean, can we make microdata available to researchers? Uh, there's a lot of research demand for, um, uh, for, ba for, for basic uh, survey data or for basic um, uh, population census data and things like that. So um, uh, how is that possible? Um, one of the principles we work with, um, and I simplify that a little bit in the context of, uh, of this privacy enhancing technology work is um, one of these, the, uh, the zero trust principle. And what that means is that um, if we can make data useful to people in, uh, so that they can use microdata for whatever purpose they do without actually seeing the data, they cannot violate any trust, right? So you could violate trust if you if you have an agreement, right? So I give you all of the microdata and I trust you that or you sign the agreement that you will not share it with anybody else um, uh, or or any kind of form in between. But if you wouldn't would be able to use the data without actually seeing any of the original data, you 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 cannot violate trust, right? Um, so that's it. I mean, a, a, a related principle, and and and, uh, and Professor Shin will say much more about that. Is um, you want to have in the in in this context of uh, responsible data sharing, you want to have guarantees guarantees for the data owner, and you want to have sufficient access for the purposes for the data users. Right. So we have to find that uh, the right balance in that. Now, the point which I'd like to discuss with you at the end is um, how can we see a, a shift of the balance in the right of society to get benefits from use of microdata versus the right of protection of privacy, right? Where can we find the balance? And if we can assure privacy, can we make more use of available data, okay? And this, you have to really think about the crisis, right? Um, if there are crises in health, health or in the economy or in the environment, and there is a lot of microdata out there that is not being used, is that a concern, right? Also for the statistical office. So if I go to my next slide, the last slide here is trying to find that balance between um, giving access or getting access uh, to data where there is like legal liability for a statistical office uh, in, in, in terms of privacy concerns. But on the other hand, do, does a statistical office have to be concerned also with, uh, with the public um, asking for more access to data because uh, because there is a lot of microdata uh, out there that could have uh, at least improved situations during a crisis and data were not used, right? So I put here the term uh, dereliction of duty in how far are, is a statistical office at some point concerned that they would not be attacked for having used data and having maybe getting a case of data privacy uh, reach. 
But on the other hand, is that data were not used, right? And things happened that could have been prevented. So, so I think that's where we would like to see if, if we can get the discussion as well. So I stop there and I will invite our leader in the area of uh, privacy enhanced technologies, uh, Andrew. Uh, maybe Andrew, you can say a little bit more about uh, uh, what you do and where you work and then jump into uh, what you want to present, maybe also indicate a little bit about what the Path Lab is doing. Okay, very good. We'll start there. And thank yeah. you so much, um, So, um, a pleasure to, to meet you all and see some of you again. I know uh, there, there was a similar event, I think, sometime last year. Um, um, so, I'm here representing uh, the United Nations Privacy and Technology Lab and Open Minds. So, for the last uh, almost seven years, Open Minds has been building free open source infrastructure for privacy and technologies and working with experts uh, such as Ronald and Sean and the team um, to, to uh, explore the degree to which these can solve important problems. So um, I come from a background as a technologist um, and I've spent time learning. Can, can everybody understand that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Does he have to speak slower? <laughs> oh, I can speak slower. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Slower. Well, slower. Well, apologies. No apologies. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I will, I will uh, 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 my apologies. So um, I am um, uh, uh, primarily a technologist. I represent technologists, um, but we have spent a, a number of years uh, seeking to understand your problems um, and the degree to which some technologies can be a good fit for them. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about today in the United Nations Privacy Enhancing Technology Lab. We meet um, every week to facilitate that discussion. Um, and this is both a, a two-way education kind of uh, direction where, where technologists learn more about the needs of the official statistics community um, and uh, the official statistics community learns more about privacy enhancing technologies. So I'm going to give some of the conclusions and some of the things that we've learned in that process. Yep. Excellent. Um, so the key problem, as Ronald just said, kind of do a handoff here, is that the official statistics community's value to society is constrained because many cannot access microdata, right, in, in various contexts. And our question for today is what prevents this microdata access? We want to take a, a closer look at the exact process, the exact way that this breaks down so that we can see if privacy enhanced technologies can be helpful. Just to, to paint a picture, um, say we have an external researcher and a national statistics office, which is holding some microdata. And the researcher says in very small text, hi, I'm trying to study the degree to which a recent national law is disproportionately affecting some demographics more than others. And I'd like to combine your microdata with my data to do so, right? So some researcher has approached an NSO asking for access to microdata. The first person they meet is the lawyer, right? And the lawyer says, your project is awesome. And I believe it can create great social value. But if we were to send you our microdata, you might use it for another purpose that got us into legal trouble. So no, I can't give you the data. They would have a similar conversation with the chief privacy officer, a similar conversation with the chief information security officer. You know, if they were to transfer the data to the external researcher, they don't know if the external researcher's security systems are as secure as the NSO, right? And so this, this triggers an unnecessary or uh, unacceptable amount of risk, somewhat from the chief financial officer. And I want to call this one out specifically because many of us, um, well, many of you in the room I know already run sort of specialized access programs that might look um, something like this, where a researcher will fly to a secure facility somewhere to sit down with, with microdata. And what, what this person would talk about, this sort of chief financial officer, would be, hey, this is expensive. It's expensive for the researcher in terms of time and money. It's expensive for the NSO in terms of having to run this facility um, to be able to facilitate this very, very high touch um, uh, interaction in order to, to get access to microdata. Um, and so if we look across these a variety of different stakeholders, and I, I know each organization, each NSO is, is, is a little bit different. So I tried to keep this at the general architect level, but for policy, security, privacy, legal, and cost reasons, access to microdata can be very, very difficult, right? And so if we think about um, um, this, this kind of summary of we have infrastructure costs, we have legal costs that are encountered by the NSO, we have researcher costs of traveling, um, there's privacy, security, and legal risk, because even in this instance, if you run a secure facility, an external researcher lays eyes on the data. So even if you're not handing them a thumb drive, there's a there's a, a spirit in which they are still obtaining kind of a copy, at least into their own brain, as a function of their access and participation. 
Um, and then I want to call out this third one at the bottom, which is no mutually secret third party data, meaning I'm a researcher and I'm accessing your existing microdata in a secure building, but there is other data in someone else's secure building that I want to leverage at the same time, and neither secure buildings will let it out of their sight. My project is blocked, right? And there's a lot of projects that I think fit this, this, this archetype, particularly important projects that are leveraging really sensitive and important data sets. And this is where we land on our high cost, our problem summary and, and the solution criterion of zero trust and safe data, right? So high cost limits the scale of researcher access. You have risks that are based on the individual having to see the data in order to work with it. And we don't get private third party data in this analysis. And this leads to the two criterion that Ronald just laid out, the zero trust principle and the safe data principle. If we have a new piece of infrastructure that can fulfill these principles, then we can unlock more social value. That's what we're going to look at. So um, I just to make that very specific. Ideally, a researcher does not have to travel. Ideally, an NSO doesn't have to run buildings in many locations. And ideally, researchers can answer their research question. I have the underlying piece here. But the researcher doesn't learn anything except the answer to their question. That would be a, a definition of perfection in this, in this area, where they can propose a question using data that you have and possibly data that others have and can extract that answer without learning anything else in the process. Now, we'll see how exactly how close we can get to that sort of hypothetical goal, but that is, I think, the spirit of what we're trying to do. So let's walk through um, the degree to which privacy enhanced technology and try to help us accomplish this. So we're going to talk about a paradigm that was that was outlined in the UN handbook on privacy preserving techniques that was produced in 2019, 2019 yeah. the first version. This was also brought up in the White House's National Strategy to Advance Privacy Preserving Data Sharing and Analytics in the United States. Um, it's also in a paper called uh, Beyond Privacy Trade Also Structured Transparency. And then uh, in a keynote speech that was brought up by um, Shafi Goldwasser, one of the world's leading cryptographers at a, a privacy preserving workshop back in 2018. Um, and then covered again in version two of the UN Handbook on Privacy Preserving Computation and Techniques. And what this paradigm says is that there are many, many different privacy enhancing technologies. You might have heard of some of them already, things like differential privacy or zero knowledge proofs or homomorphic encryption or federated learning. And what this paradigm says is that first, they can be grouped. There are some technologies that solve similar problems, meaning these technologies are a little bit substitute for one another. All right, so that we have kind of four groups we can talk about here in a moment. But the overall principle is that the pets make it possible to answer a question using data owned by someone else, and that the value proposition of pets comes out when they are used collectively together, so that there is no one single privacy enhancing technology that solves the whole problem for you, and that these are actually component parts in a high level system for extracting the answers to specific questions while not learning anything else. And this is the, this, the kind of state of the art. Um, um, uh, frontier of the research conversation around the privacy enhanced technologies. It's something that might not be obvious. Each one of those pets that's in the bottom of that slide came from a different research community, came from a different conference, came from a different you know, location inside of universities. <laughs> Someone said, oh, wait, this might be useful for preserving privacy. Huh, let's write a paper about that. And 10 to 20 years later, people went, oh my gosh, look at all these different research fields all trying to solve privacy. And for the last three to five years, they've been trying to figure out how these different puzzle pieces actually fit together. Um, and that's sort of the state of the art where we are today. And what I want to describe for you is what it starts to look like and how it will start to uh, the potential for it to improve your programs when they are viewed as a collective unit, if that, if that makes sense. Okay, so the idea is for many years, people have been, to use the analogy of a car, many people have been working on these component parts but we're just now getting to the point where we have an end-to-end -end car that is sort of easy to use. You don't have to worry about how the low-level technologies actually work. So what is the car of pets? Car of pets, I would say, is a, a, a particular type of web server. And this web server allows someone who owns data to load their you know, private microdata into a server to create accounts for external data scientists and then to leave and allow this server to enforce their definition of use and misuse. 
Meaning this server allows an external researcher to log in to generate the answers to just a loud set of questions. So questions that fulfill the NSO's remit, right? So for example, this is where all the privacy enhancing technologies end up fitting in. It's all about that enforcement of what, you know, if, if this is health data, you know, can I facilitate them answering the question of what causes cancer or how much cancer do we have in our population without being able to answer the question, does a specific person have cancer? Right? Different types of questions, right? So privacy enhancing technologies fit in this context at facilitating different questions being answerable while other questions cannot be answerable and enforcing that um, at the cryptographic level. And then being able to download the answers to those specific questions. Again, the idea in a perfect world, they're only able to download the approved answers without learning anything else that they did not specifically request a lot. That's the ideal that we want to strive for. So notice what's missing in this type of regime. You know, formal data partnerships, more meetings with lawyers getting on the getting on the phone, background checks, and any type of delay or travel. Under this aspiration that if the researcher is only able to download the answer to a specific question that has been approved, this really greases the wheels on lots of cost and infrastructure and legal risk, compliance risk, privacy risk, because we have upheld two principles that Ronald was just talking about. Right? We're kind of go, digging into the practical side of what that looks like. So, um, the uh, um, what are the kind of, but before we just talk, finish about the cars of pets, I want to talk about the roads. What does it mean for an ecosystem to exist with these types of technologies? And I want to, I want you to see this picture where there is a handful of blue boxes at the bottom that represent individual national statistics offices that have different types of data and networks that exist that do not hold data, but serve, provide a secure virtual environment, which is both a, a legal network, so the ability to kind of approve projects together as a group, right? So if someone asks to do a project that requires data from you know, your institutes and your institute, that someone can submit a project and that you get some type of conversation between the two of you on your joint approval of these types of projects. In addition to being a security layer that ensures that you're able to collectively facilitate data access to your two institutes but without you know, any, you know, with, a, with, with a hard wall between you, the two of you and the researcher um, on the cryptography side. So just to give you a, a, a cartoon version of how this works, you know, data scientists can submit a project through the network um, and it goes down to various uh, locations that have data, different locations are approving or disapproving whether they approve of this question and the way in which it's being asked. Right? So this is a similar to the project approval process. And then after, their, after that approval process, they're able to use privacy enhanced technologies to extract the answer to a specific question without extracting the other. Uh, yeah. uh, good question. Absolutely. Approval process, you, 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 we have to imagine to be this automated, fully automated. Or? So this is, I think, where we talk about the maturity of individual privacy enhanced technology. So I think today, it does not need to be fully automated. Um, the, there's a there's a basic level by which the, the manual approval can be facilitated, uh, but we're skipping past say the need to travel or some some of these kind of like base costs or run against a secure facility. Um, <clears throat> however, one of the benefits of, of some privacy enhanced technologies like differential privacy or synthetic data or these types of things is that they can provide a configuration based enforcement, meaning you configure this server to enforce your will, and that's what allows your administrators to go off, be having coffee and doing their thing while different people are accessing that information. In the same way that um, prior to the internet, you know, if someone wanted information from a library, they would call you on the phone and one of your employees would have to answer it and then go look for the data and then bring it back and then hand the data to them, right? But now when you have a website or a web server, people are accessing that website all the time without necessarily operationally involving members of your staff, right? So the, the, the long-term aim of privacy and technology technologies is to provide that type of configuration-based enforcement so that the scale at which you can serve the community that, 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 you, that you do serve is not tethered to the number of staff or the number of chairs you have in a secure building or these, these types of things, right? But this is, um, I, I would expect each organization to take steps towards that and not have to jump straight to 100% trusting that configuration base. Yeah, excellent. Um, Okay, so the grand vision here is that you know, we can have massive federated data networks of non-public information, right? Non-public microdata, which a, a scientist, an external researcher can submit projects to 
jointly approve and extract just the answers to specific questions, right? So that instead of, you know, previously where they need to acquire copies of various data sets they might need to use, which is, you know, prohibitively expensive and in many cases impossible, right? Um, my animation is a little slow here. Um, um, but instead they would sit at the center of this type of network and would submit projects to the different locations and only extract the answers to specific questions. So let's talk about a couple pilots and then I'll hand it over to Sushi. So um, we're, we're running a handful of projects across a variety of different NSOs. Um, and the, the goal here is to show that individuals can extract the answers to specific questions using a process and procedure that these different stakeholders, you know, the legal, policy, security, et cetera, et cetera, um, feel comfortable with because it is adhering to their existing standards, right? And this is the, this is the idea. We're trying to scale and lower the cost and lower the risk of enforcing existing desires, existing definitions of use and misuse that come from legal department, policy department, security department. So, um, um, and we're going to go to this, this archetype. I've listed the six different uh, uh, national citizens offices, several of whom are represented today. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so uh, uh, INEGI of Mexico, StatCan in Canada, INE in Uruguay, IBGE in Brazil, um, ESTAT in Italy, and Census Bureau in the United States. Um, so one project um, is to, to uh, use the UN Global Platform to enable remote access to microdata for external researchers. So this project is still ongoing, um, and we are uh, working through a, uh, uh, a um, uh, synthetic data uh, uh, proof, which is first going through with, with, with mock information, the steps that different parts of the organization would take to approve a specific type of project so that each one of those stakeholders knows how they retain control over their information when facilitating access in this way. If that makes sense. So sort of a dress rehearsal for the real thing. Um, um, second project uh, that is going on um, in INE in Uruguay uh, under this same idea that, that we, can, we can move towards access to microdata um, remotely and through this type of procedure first by doing a dress rehearsal, first by doing a, a example so that the different governors and controllers of that information get a sense of, of knowledge, empowerment, and trust, and confidence that they are still retaining control despite the fact that there is not a secure building people are walking into checking their keys. And, all this, this kind of stuff, right? um, and then the third project um, is uh, to dem demonstrate an international join and write a paper on the process and opportunities. So, um, there are three organizations engaged in this project. Mm -hmm. One is Statistics Canada, ESTAT in Italy, and Census Bureau in the United States. We'll mm -hmm. talk more about that um, briefly in a moment. So the current status um, for Statistics Canada, INE in Uruguay, IBGE in Brazil, and ESTAT in Italy um, is that we've loaded mock data, trade data for experimentation by external researchers. This is actually it's real data, but it was data that was already made public, um, if that makes sense. Um, and external researchers are, are working to uh, facilitate access through the network hosted by the United Nations Global Platform uh, to do experiments on the data that is hosted in this, this, this network. Um, another current status is uh, for I, uh, INEGI and, and in Mexico and Census Bureau in the United States is in the infrastructure deployment phase, so a little bit earlier, so setting up of these servers, configuring them with um, the, the security teams, the infrastructure teams, <laughs> And working to connect them to the, the virtual private network hosted on the UN global platform. Um, and finally, I want to share a, a very recent achievement, um, which is I'm, I'm very excited about, and I think you'll hear more about this type of thing uh, in a moment, which was a, a successful join uh, using microdata between, or sorry, using um, uh, mock data, mock microdata between uh, Statistics Canada um, and East Ad in Italy. And what this join uh, ultimately accomplished was an external researcher, an external researcher, submitted a project to two organizations leveraging mock data at those two organizations each of those organizations said do i want to approve this answer this question being answered in this specific way with this specific you know researcher code right and then once that was approved by everyone who was contributing data to that specific research answer the uh, associate assets were encrypted move to what's called a secure enclave, which is a special chip that can operate on encrypted data. We'll talk about how that works for conversation. Um, and then what comes out of that chip in the end is an, a piece of an encrypted result that only the external researcher was able to observe, if that makes sense. So the only party that learned anything in this whole process was just the external researcher. 
And the only thing they learned was not the raw data from one organization or the raw data from another organization. They only learned the answer to their question. It was based on computation that came from encrypted data from both organizations. Um, so it's a really exciting pilot. It just happened uh, a couple weeks ago. So to come back to our key problem, the official statistics community's value to society is constrained because many can't access microdata. Um, our hypothesis is, based, and based on these results, that we can significantly increase the number of questions that can directly leverage underlying microdata while mitigating the costs and risks of doing so, lowering the cost of these types of access problems, increasing the ability to do third-party joints, and that the, the, the grand vision, right, is that there would be a global network for official statistics. So that when researchers needed to answer specific important questions, the data would be available and propose, uh, uh, propose such projects. Um, and that, you know, in, in a few years from now, that the, the ability to answer really any question using non-public information would be widely available um, because we, we lifted the costs and constraints and risks that are currently being imposed today. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so thank you for uh, for for guiding us through this. So there's a lot of of, um, of high tech behind what uh, Andrew was explaining in in very understandable way, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so there was a lot of implementation of of algorithm software uh, IP going on uh, in these various organizations, which Andrew indicated are working with us. He has to understand that, and so he had to go with the organizations through their red tape of being able to use their IT infrastructure to put these kinds of uh, uh, solutions on there. Uh, so that's those steps have been taken, and I can see that that's a, a major achievement to be able to have the uh, NSO working with them to actually uh, use their uh, IT facilities to make those connections, even if it is not tape. Uh, before I go to Sujin, any quick question? Yes. Really quick one, and that was absolutely really, really helpful and clear. I'm just looking at you know this evolving X. We're starting from a place we're more familiar with traditional disclosure control techniques. With mo this mosaic effect is always a really big driver, isn't it? That We've controlled individual questions or individual tables, mm -hmm. but you put it all together and you do have a disclosure risk. Right. How does that work in the pet space where you're asking multiple questions from multiple sources? Yep. And there's a human factor on what question is acceptable. Mm -hmm. What's that layer that's looking at that mosaic effect and how we adjust what is acceptable question? Fantastic question. Should we answer this now? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so, uh, uh, first, um, any, uh, I'm, I'm, because you can do manual code review um, just remotely, uh, any type of disclosure control uh, policy you currently have can be applied in this environment. Uh, that makes sense. So, that's like your baseline. You can make the same decision. Um, however, um, uh, that process, as you said, is can be vulnerable to the mosaic effect if you have. 50 different people enforcing different pieces of policy and an external researcher gets a little bit of an answer over here, a little bit of an answer over here, a little bit of an answer here. And when they combine them together, all of a sudden, ooh, I can pinpoint a specific person that has a disease or something about this, right? Um, synthetic data, um, uh, which has been piloted in, in the US very recently, um, is one way to, to, uh, uh, to avoid, uh, but it comes at a very high privacy cost, right? Um, in the sense of you take a, a data set you add noise to the overall data set and you release this one asset and then everyone has to share access to that, that synthetic data set. Um, this um, it is great from the protection side, but it's difficult from the utility side because you can't tune, like if someone needs to zoom in on one particular small subset of the population that was noised over to protect the broader piece, it's hard to navigate that privacy utility trade-off. Um, and we can talk about this more in the discussion section as well. There is um, a kind of next version of uh, uh, of differential privacy technologies that instead of pre-noising data that you've been hands over uh, in advance, um, you keep track of what's called a privacy budget, which is the probability that someone might be able to, to conduct that reconstruction attack, keeping it in 0.0001%, whatever the case might be, tracked um, for every individual data subject in your database, and tracked against every single data scientist or researcher that is accessing it. 
And this allows you to answer questions like, okay, if all the researchers colluded together to combine all of their research results, what's the probability that they could restore information that is specific about this person? And then you might say, oh, okay, they're not all going to glue together. This is an unreasonable restriction because the more restrictive you are, the more restricted, the less accurate answers can be. So then you can start to model probabilities. Okay, if, if up to 50 researchers at a time started to collude together, right? Like, which is, I think, still logistically a very difficult thing for, the, for them to do. What's the, what's the potential reconstruction risk? All of this, and, and when I say the words like, what's the probability they might be able to reconstruct, that might trigger fear in your hearts. Like, well, the, the, the answer has to be zero, it has to be no risk, right? But if you look at today's existing disclosure avoidance protocols, there is some risk. Um, but what privacy and technologies have given us is a rigorous way to discreetly measure that risk. So now we understand how, how big it is, um, and this is the cost of further investigating that. So I would, I would encourage looking into um, automatic or adversarial differential privacy techniques. Um, that. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah, I think the, uh, and we'll come back to that discussion is why, we're trying to find the balance that, can, that there will not be zero risk on the data privacy side, unless you don't give access at all, right? And there is like, what is the, the, the benefits or uh, at, at the side of, of being able to use that data? So I think there is where the balance uh, it needs to be uh, sorted. Eugene, please go Thank ahead. You. My, if everyone's okay with it, I want to stand a little bit. My back is killing me. Anyone else have a background? <laughs> 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 so, we have to take a picture of me. Yep. I need a proof. Yeah. <laughs> it's here. Indeed. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Soyang Kim. I currently work as the head of product at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health. Uh, we're about 25 people, uh, comprised of microbiologists data scientists, statistician, and ontology curators within our group. Uh, we are affiliated with Climate Fraser University, uh, but in fact, much of our funding comes from service contract. So we partner very closely with organizations such as FDA and also Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, we focus on pathogenomic research um, as part of our work. So prior to my role at the lab, I was uh, an informatics director at Province Health uh, uh, province healthcare. So I spent about six years or so in uh, health informatics. So prior to that, 14 years or so in analytics space, uh, working as a PSTAT. And in fact, that's uh, when I first met uh, Ronalds and, and the team at UNSD. I serve as the chair of accreditation committee at Statistical Society of Canada. So work I'm about to uh, share with you guys today is about data sharing during the pandemic and our continuing work to improve healthcare data interoperability. So this was and is the work of many different people. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our partners. We uh, collaborate very closely at the regional level, national and global level. And I'll talk uh, more about why that level of collaboration is key for our work. So I'm gonna take you back to the pandemic for a minute. I was diagnosed with cancer during the pandemic as a immune compromised cancer patient. The pandemic was really scary. So on behalf of my cancer patient, I'd like to tell you how important data sharing is. During the pandemic especially, data sharing had a significant impact on our collective well-being. Anywhere from fueling research, so life-saving research such as vaccine development, to public health intervention, the so data sharing was significant on our collective health. It posed unique challenges as well, so coordination. So hospitals and regional CDC had to send their data into national agency and from national agencies such as Public Health Agency of Canada, they had to share their data with global agencies such as NCBI and ESA as a repository. So if you think about number of government involved and organization involved as part of the overall process, it was quite the undertaking. So the level of coordination, that was a challenge. Another challenge, speed. So SARS-CoV-2 virus was a fast mutating virus. So it was reported to have something like 15 defining mutation every couple of months, each mutation leading to different severity and transmissibility. So it was critical that the data sharing be done in a timely fashion, fast. So this is a little bit about what we've done uh, at a high level. So you're looking at the national surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 data sharing that happened in Canada. 
So on the left to right, so as I mentioned, a lot of data collected from the hospitals um, and the sample data from CDC, it has to be collected and standardized and harmonized, ready for upload. And then they were deposited into the national database, operated and managed by Public Health Agency of Canada. From there, it had to be further disseminated into the global repository, such as ESA and NCBI. So this was quite the undertaking left to right. So our lab has developed a suite of tools used for the purposes of harmonization and standardization as part of this process. We were successful in, in terms of being able to share metadata, but challenges do remain. To this day, we do not have real-time or near real-time data sharing flow. And in addition to that, some of the data owners, especially hospitals, were very reluctant to share patient information. So we have data availability issues as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about data sharing for research. So the team, the Cancogen team, early on decided to adopt this classification. So the data that are considered to be safe and data that are considered to be sensitive. So open and closed. So we have developed two platforms. So BioSig is an open data platform, use for safe data. And the HOSI that's used for sensitive data and is closely governed as a closed platform. Although we adopted this binary classification, pretty soon in reality, we realized that even with the data that are considered to be safe, we had privacy issue. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in early on of the pandemic, the patient information combined with sample information, it could be cross-referenced against other sources of information, such as news article, reporting an outbreak in a long-term care facility, for example. So the team adopted and experimented with a number of techniques, uh, deletion and masking and so on. We struggle with the trade-off between utility of data and privacy. So recognizing those challenges and also with the lesson learned from the pandemic, our team has been uh, adopting a new series of approaches and experimenting uh, with those. And privacy enhancing technology is a big part of that. Just to introduce you to a couple of those, the first one is the genome-wide associative study using secure enclave. So this was done in AWS using multi-tenancy um, using nit nitro instance. This was to understand the association between specific genotype and outbreak information. The second one is um, this is about granting access to third party researchers to EHR data, the sensitive patient information uh, that are collected during scale outbreak. So, if the third party researcher wanted to gain access and do some computation on top of EHR data, what does that look like? So, we demonstrated feasibility of a, a secure multi party computation as part of this process. Uh, so, this was to understand. Antimicrobial anti resistance and social determinant of health, uh, specifically housing status, homeless or not. So, as you all know, that disaggregating and disseminating health data at this level of granularity has been a huge challenge. And this is where I believe privacy enhancing technology can be a game changer. So, as we're going beyond a pilot, as Andrew mentioned, to operationalize privacy enhancing technology, we recognize there are common challenges. So we're getting into this, what I call lost miles. So what I refer to when I say lost miles, so things like risk assessment process, privacy assessment, security assessment, getting organizations buy-in, thinking about contingency, and so on. So we recognize there's common challenges that we're all experiencing. So the UN Health Lab, uh, together with our lab, we have been conducting a series of expert interviews to better understand what others are doing in terms of risk assessment using five state as a framework. So uh, we're compiling risk registry and what are some of the common risks and remediation that people are doing. Uh, we hope to publish this work. Uh, so for example, if someone is uh, using CP sharing, how can that be demonstrated against say people pillar within five state, for example? 
We hope to publish this work to the Statistical Journal of Official Statistics uh, sometime this year. So to summarize the last slide, existing data sharing too slow. So I mentioned that if it's not enough of pressing issue, time sensitive issues such as pandemic data sharing. And consequences of decision making on less than fulsome data. So Ronald uh, uh, mentioned about this as well. So I mentioned there was a data availability issue because some of the hospitals were very reluctant to share data. So what are some of the consequences of a critical decision making, such as public health intervention, be done on less than fulsome data? Lack of trust. A lot of organizations and people are familiar with traditional way of doing things traditional way of data sharing and traditional architecture that's often centralized and is using binary classification, safe or not safe. As a pet, privacy enhancing technology proposed a new way of doing things, then it's not always well understood. So people are asking for cereal and we're giving them eggs, for example. <laughs> Emerging pet ecosystem, Andrew mentioned about this before as well. So we have emerging uh, privacy enhancing technology ecosystem that's emerging across many, many different domains, NSOs, healthcare, and many others. And we have uh, joining, and we have people joining from many different backgrounds, data scientists, statisticians, vendors, policymakers, researchers. So if researchers are generating evidence in support of pet, how can that evidence be used to empower policymakers? So how can we grow and sustain this emerging ecosystem? So this is a question for you and for powerful people in this room. Just to wrap up, um, I'd like to share my recent conversation with Genome Canada leadership just recently. And the topic was around, are we ready for the next pandemic? And the answer was no. Clearly, we have a lot of work ahead of us and we cannot do it alone. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Soji. Um, any question at this point? Quick question. Uh, let's go to, uh, uh, thank you, Soji. Let's go, let's go to the presentation of Massimo uh, and, and then we'll open up for general discussion. Uh, Massimo. He's from uh, the Statistical Office of Italy uh, and working on some uh, collaborative projects uh, 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 internationally. Uh, Massimo, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Ronald. Good morning, everyone. I, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, I'm going to present you uh, joint work in collaboration with uh, colleagues from uh, Statistics Canada, ESTAT, Statistics Netherlands, ONS UK and Oblivious AI. The presentation concerns the private set intersection project. And the private set intersection is a, um, a technique that allows to integrate uh, two or more data set at the micro data level in a privacy preserving manner. So, next slide. Okay, let's go straight to the use case. Uh, the use case is around the um, international trade agreements, like uh, CETA, for instance. And uh, the key questions uh, of this use case is, uh, why do some firms not make use of preferential trade agreements? Uh, so parts of this answer and other, uh, many other um, research questions lies with the trade partner. And the information about international trade partner is typically unknown to the researcher because the researcher generally have access only to aggregated data and to aggregated information. But strict privacy laws prevent sharing microdata internationally amongst national statistics offices. So, in this sense, privacy enhancing technologies can offer solutions, and we look specifically at private set intersection. Here is also the link to the UN PET guide for official statistics that Andrew mentioned before, and uh, is, the project is related with this kind of techniques. Now, let's see the roadmap of this project. 
we started prior to 2020 uh, when we developed uh, an open source cryptographic private set intersection protocol at ISTAT. Then in 2020 started the UNEC project on input privacy preservation. We worked at an international trade use case using the solution proposed by ISTAT with this protocol. At the end of this project, in, uh, at the beginning of 2023, the project and the staff moved, moved to United Nations PET Lab. We continue to work on international trade use case, but we change the kind of technique uh, applying, uh, applied to this use case, and uh, we move ver um, in, into a technique named the Secure Enclave. The Secure Enclave is a special hardware that allows um, us to perform calculation uh, in privacy preserving manner in an isolated and protected environment. So um, let's see the challenges ahead. We have many challenges when we use this kind of technique. We have legal challenges related with um, uh, the fact that the PET must be compliant with the legal constraints, but the legal constraints are, are not the same in all the countries. For instance, in Europe, in, in, uh, Union, in European Union, we have the GDPR, but in other countries, there are other kinds of legislation and PET have to be compliant with all these uh, kind of legislation. Then there are also organizational challenges related with the implementation of PET in the pipeline to, produ to produce statistics. Uh, in general, are required the specific technical skills. Uh, there are also some costs, costs to implement this solution and the integration with the existing systems is a challenge as well. About practical user perspective, we have to consider also that for the researcher and the people that have to manage data when we apply the, this kind of technique, they have to learn a completely different way to work. Then we have to consider also the trust model to adopt. We have different possibilities. We have to evaluate centralized the trust model versus distributed ones. And we also can consider model where there is a third neutral party or not. And so we have considered all these aspects. Then we have to evaluate also if uh, adopt a custom purpose, a custom solution or a general purpose solution. There are pro and cons. Obviously, custom solutions are tailored on the user needs, but are more expensive. And general purpose solutions are cheaper, as, uh, as you know. Then the long-term goal is a very ambitious and is to realize, to, to build an international platform where national statistic offices can share and analyze the data in a private way. And then let's see the project. The project we started in 2020, as I have already said, with the UNEC project on input privacy preservation. I have no time to give you all the details, but you can find it in this final report at this link. Then in 2023, we are working under the umbrella of a United Nations, in particular in the UN PET Lab, and we are working on a probabilistic record linkage on international trade data, while evaluating the linkage accuracy automatically in an ISF manner. Then we are implementing some algorithms machine learning like linear regression, logistic regression, random forest on the linked data within the secure enclave. And we are using the solution proposed by Oblivious that is an anti-granular platform. Then we are testing and evaluating how differential privacy can better protect the data set while maintaining high quality machine learning model performance. And uh, the last but not the least, we are working also uh, to, to produce, to show an upcoming presentation uh, within the UN PET Lab. About the lesson learned, the privacy set intersection fits very well with the national statistics offices privacy preserving needs, but require more works. Then there are many technological components, but not a complete solution that integrates all the required features. 
Further work is required regarding flow governance. This is a crucial point because uh, the flow governance is very important. It means, uh, for instance, policies and procedures to control who can use the pet infrastructure. And in general, the main obstacles are not technological, but there are, there are also legal concerns. From a technological point of view, we are in a mature phase, in a mature stage of the art, but we have to have for the way to deal with the legal and organizational concerns. Then the collaboration and team working are key. In our experiences, the partnership with Oblivious AI has been fundamental and highly beneficial. About plans for the future, the midterm goals are to continue to investigate private set intersection application within the context of official <coughs> statistics and to disseminate the project outcomes through presentation, reports and scientific papers. In the long term, we have a very ambitious goals, that is to create a platform where various international and national statistical offices can share and analyze each other's data in a privacy secure way. Comes with future technical, organizational, legal and practical challenges. For instance, users and national statistical offices need to accustom themselves with a different way of working. Okay, thank you for your attention. And uh, hand it over uh, to you, Ronald, for the questions. Thank you, much, uh, thank you very much, Massimo, for the work that is that is ongoing between national statistical offices. So there is, in this space, we do have uh, quite a few experts uh, working with us. So within this task team is a variety of people working uh, uh, there. Uh, so we have. Um, uh, private sector, we have uh, NGOs, if I can say so, or academics, uh, and more academics, uh, and then also experts from national statistical offices. I think uh, in, in opening the discussion, we have maybe 15 minutes or so, uh, 20 minutes uh, uh, before uh, people will want to go and leave this room. Um, I think one very important part that, that both uh, uh, Andrew and, um, and Sujin indicated is that there is a a variety of players in this space of use of privacy and ethics technologies. There is obviously a lot of uh, technology involved, right? But in the end, it will be a discussion with policy, with the uh, um, legal side, the policies, and the senior managers in if this is actually going to be applied in your office, right? Somebody's got to make the decision that you are going to use privacy and exit technologies, and that you are going to use this in a real case, right? Uh, so far, uh, we've been working with data that are not so sens not sensitive. But <laughs> at what point are we ready in your office to actually use this sensitive data and share this in what kind of form uh, between offices, have researchers, have others access to this? So. Um, I think it will be a very gradual uh, process in giving access uh, in a very controlled manner. Uh, but um, I do think that this is uh, something that is really important for the coming years. There is so much information out there um, that we would like to access, that we would like to combine with data that statistical offices have. And I think we have to face the uh, technology and legal problems and get over this to be able to use it, right? There cannot be 100% safeguards on the privacy side. There will be some, some margin of, of risk that you need to take, but then the benefit of it might pay off very well, right? And also the risk of not using available data, as we also indicated, Cost, can cost lives if you like, right? You, or let's put it this way, you can save lives by doing this, right? And, and it was very, uh, very clear during the, uh, the global health pandemic. So who would like to give some comments? I see Osama and Andre. Osama, you want to start first and then get troubles. Yeah, uh, so thanks for three very good presentations. Um, so, I'm a bit of a broken record for those either old enough to have grown up with vinyl or those nowadays hip enough to be part of the vinyl 
Bible <laughs> and saying that, you know, it's kind of the core thing that we should be doing always, always, always is getting the data infrastructure right. And then AI and things like that is just the icing on the cake. And I think actually sort of for us at the ONS, uh, privacy enhancing technologies are helping us get the data infrastructure right. So, so we're focusing currently on just two things, uh, synthetic data, uh, because I think that just if you follow the open safety model in the UK, that just helps uh, researchers develop hypotheses, which they can then confirm with real data. And so we're looking initially at in our own stuff internally. And we've already synthesized the 2021 census, and we're looking at making that uh, available to researchers. And then the other thing we're focusing on is privacy preserving record linkage. Uh, and that's probably well, arguably especially relevant in the UK because we don't have a single national ID. It might be less relevant in other places. Um, I would say, so, so senior people are often a bit like, uh, they start a little bit complicated and technical. Uh, what do you mean eyes off approaches? No, 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 no. Many NSOs rely on some, you know, the five safes. Uh, and I think just strategically, we cannot... I've seen some people say, oh, well, you know, you have that, you don't have to worry about five safes. You can't pit uh, privacy enhancing technologies against the five safes. I think rather you have to uh, argue about how privacy enhancing technologies uh, can actually be a mechanism through which, you know, the five safes are achieved rather than having some sort of agent. Don't have to worry about that. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for those uh, comments. Yeah, let's let's go take take some more comments and then we we'll get back to uh, and uh, and okay. so 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 thanks for, for the presentations. Um, as some of you might know, and Ronald knows, um, I used to be responsible for the area of StatScan that does a lot of this work and some of the, the work that Massimo presented. Uh, but I'm not anymore. I'm in another area. So I find it interesting that I have to come to New York to sort of find out campaigns about stuff that we're working on. Um, Nevertheless, I, I, the, the question that you're asking is, is in my view, really fundamental, right? So there is a balance between privacy and access. And what is that, that, that boundary? What is that balance? Um, and, uh, and I think as we've heard today, um, it's more than just technology. Um, so what are these other pieces, right? So um, for us uh, at Statistics Canada, we've worked really hard um, with the, the, the privacy functionary in Canada, or the privacy uh, landscape, um, to really think about the ethics around data access, and um, you know, focusing on terminology from the, the privacy sector, uh, mainly necessity and proportionality. Um, so when we actually now go out and, and, and uh, try to get access to uh, to a data set. Whether it's an administrative data set from government or whether it's a third party data set, um, the first thing we do is we look at well, why are we doing this? And we have to demonstrate to ourselves and we have a whole structure of ethics committees and so on to look at this and say, well, is that collection actually necessary? And, and what's the outcome of it that's coming from it? The other part of that is proportionality. So it's really looking at, okay, so. Um, we determined it's it's necessary, um, but is the collection actually proportional to the need? And in making that determination, we also think about the harm that could happen if sort of you know, inevitably the, the data gets disposed. So, you know, and in, in inter intermixed with all that are discussions about the ethics and the legalities and so on. The other really important element, um, and, and this is something that's not really tangible. <coughs> But it's the idea of building trust and, um, you know, uh, the social acceptability around sharing of that data. Um, and, and that's a that's a tricky business because you, you might even you might be able to describe necessity, the proportionality of it. It might be a perfectly good thing to do from a, a, an analytical policy making perspective, but society just hasn't caught up to the ideas. And, and if that's the case, um, then you're doomed as an organization trying to sort of do that. Even though you might have the best technology, there's just these, these positions that people take related to sort of the, the use of their data. Um, and, and so we need to spend a lot of time 
building that, that, that trust and working on social acceptability. We've done actually a lot of work on what is acceptable and so on, and try to create these indexes and, and so on from a methodological perspective, just to help us guide that work. Um, and of course, so, you know, once you've done all that, I, I think this is the, the, the great marriage. So you have to work on the, uh, the, the, the social factors, um, but then, you know, you marry that with the, the technological uh, aspects and hopefully you have a winning recipe. Those documents would be would be also publicly available. You think? Uh, yeah, a lot of what I said is you can yeah. just go to the Stats Can Trust Center. There's a whole corner on our website. Mark Burke makes a little one point on that. I think use cases are important, right? So, so in the UK, we were able to open up the genetic database for research purposes, right? And the, and the reason that happened is, is because we brought brought in patient representative groups. Uh, and they brought in Cancer Research UK and convinced them. And the, and the argument was simple. The argument is if we open this up, we are likely to find better treatments for cancer and earlier. And kind of what we say is, you know, as we, just, we, can, well, we can open up data for research, as we say that in an abstract way, or, you know, we'll have better statistics, which we say in an abstract way. And we don't actually sell the, well, you know, I think not just on this in general, NSO though pretty rubbish at explaining the advantage and why what we do makes citizens' lives better. And we really need to do that. It's kind of here. Yeah. 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 Saving lives. Yeah. Well, uh, so we have two hands on the screen. With Mary. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. So let's, well, we have Pietro, Rifa, and then we go to the screen. And there's still a couple of things on top of the vehicle. Um, Pietro. So, uh, one question. Yeah, yeah. Very easy to or comments. I'm not, yeah, I'm not an expert on uh, this field and so on, but the problem for me is uh, the fact that uh, usually you don't know your question when you want to do a research, or it's not very clear, and uh, this becomes clear as you dig in data. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if how this technology ensure that the community of long-term inquiry about another use case is like that uh, maybe you want to I mean there are uh, other areas that are uh, very important and uh, which, uh, I think that this uh, work would be very useful one is uh, sharing with the private sector Right. And the other problem is the problem of, uh, especially in developing countries, uh, the fact that the data access of uh, other uh, prime ministries, uh, other data providers of the national statistical system, which uh, don't give access to the national statistical of their data. So, okay. Well, you keep those questions, yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll, I'll continue uh, to the other uh, comments and questions. Ripa. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ron, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's just a, a few thoughts. First of all, what makes data sensitive? Um, do we have a accepted definition? And I'm intentionally making it rhetoric because I, I'll come to that, my last point. And how different things are uh, from the dissemination of DHS micro data sets, because there are lots and lots of very sensitive information and they collect blood samples and they make those data available. And it's been going on for a long, long time. So we are certainly going into this path again, data and so forth. So definitely we, we are looking into it a new realm of data and so forth. But I would like to understand this thing. Um, third, uh, I don't know whether you know WHO, precisely the answer to your question, that are we ready for the next pandemic, is why WHO created now the Berlin hub on pandemic and epidemic intelligence. I don't know whether you were aware of that and uh, whether you uh, are working with them uh, and so forth. Uh, perhaps not, but this is actually our um, answer, at least from the data side, do some forecasting is what is happening um, and what is around the corner and so forth. 
And finally, and this is related to my first point, is uh, we are very much ready to collaborate and help the migration. And um, I tell you um, an example, and our and our Canadian colleague mentioned that when we started to, to collect the data on um, the impact of uh, pandemic, the, the COVID-19 on the refugee migrant population, we needed to go through, like all data collection, we needed to go through the ethics uh, clearance for WHO. And our ethics review committee is it's actually the probably the worst I've ever seen in terms of the, the rigor they, they look at because one of the questions they were asking, and I mean, I could not um, even believe that our own uh, WHO ethics was actually working against WHO in a sense, because they were saying that you are an intergovernmental organization. You have to make sure that data doesn't fall in the hands of the governments, because if it does, then this vulnerable population will be a uh, jeopardy. And like uh, the first thing I learned when I got into this, uh, this job is they are vulnerable population and then any data related to them is vulnerable and therefore sensitive and so forth. So, uh, and uh, the, the reason I asked the first question is sort of I'm giving an answer to the, the question myself that I'm, I'm very much willing to, I'm very much eager to learn what makes data sensitive or vulnerable? Thank you. Thank you, Rifa. It's a question of Diego. I'll go to you first because I know that some people might have to leave to uh, Diego. Um, Diego is from uh, Uruguay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm the coordinator of the National Institute of, so, of Uruguay. Thank you for, for the presentation. I think uh, that uh, we, as as ethical. Um, Bodies, we have this important trade-off between preserving the, the privacy, but also to give access to important data sets. And, and, and in fact, in the case of Uruguay, why we are compiling information from many minister, minister, uh, ministries, um, so we have a very big database. Um, I, I think that these kind of technologies are important because we need, in one, in one hand, to explain the trade-off that we have, uh, that of course always there are some some risk, but we also have to explain that we have taken some uh, measures to, to to protect the data. I think this this uh, sometimes uh, is is enough uh, for for the public because um, we know that it is impossible to have uh, certainty about uh, protecting uh, always. But I think uh, these technologies helps us to protect and also to explain that we're taking uh, some measures. And of course, the risk will be always, always there. But I think this, this is uh, um, great, great, great thing to have the help of this uh, technology. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very good point, that uh, if, if you explain to the public, especially like all of the measures that have been taken to protect data, while still giving access to it, uh, I think that that's great. Uh, thank you. I have to leave. I go to uh, to the screen. Uh, I cannot really see from here. So, Sean, you have to help me. Um, who yes, the hands have, are off? So, we have number one is Mary Mary E from Statistics Canada. If you don't mind, you can mute yourself. Hi. Uh, I'll mute yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Mariev, and I am the manager for privacy intensive technology at StatsCan, working with Andre Laurangerie. And um, I would like just to add up something, because something was said about the five safe uh, a little bit earlier. And I just wanted to know, uh, wanted to let you know that we are working for having next fiscal year actually um, a document and a program that would say how our privacy intensive technology will answer the five safe. So I am actually actively working on it with the legal team, the ethic team, necessity, proportionality, and I'm coming up with a framework on how this could be used in StatsCan. So we will have more answers next fiscal year about this. Uh, just wanted to say we're also working on trust of public by doing a proof of concept with other departments that they will use to exactly build this trust, solely for building trust. 
So we are doing progress in this in this sense. And uh, obviously, the legal question is always a case by case, depending on what we're using. Some technology goes, so others it's I need to know more. I need to know more. So this is also the communication on how the technology works with the legal team. I am seeing now how important it is that they understand where the data is in movement, where it is at rest. This makes the whole difference. Just one fast comment. And one more question to uh, the audience. Um, I'm, my team is working with Massimo on the UN Pet Lab, and uh, we would like to, we're wondering also what could be, because we're going to start testing with fake data, and we're wondering what would be the best fake data or best topic we should do between an SO, this kind of test to come to real data at one point. What would be the most beneficial one? I heard health at the beginning uh, from um, uh, is it Andrew or Ronald that said that. So I'm just wondering what your opinion is on what would be the best data set or topic that we should use for this, the most beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for the question. Um, just on a matter of time, uh, I will finish at, uh, in, at 9.50 because uh, some people, uh, the official meeting is starting at 10 o'clock and some people have to walk over. So 9.50, we'll stop. Uh, so one question to Fabio. I see it. Good to see you. Uh, Fabio works for Eurostat. Uh, please, please go ahead. Short, short comment question, please, Fabio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was a remark very short? First of all, what I appreciated from the talk of Andrew is that I think it highlights that uh, we need to talk about governance. It's privacy and asset technology should be used to implement uh, governance uh, policy, not to bypass or to evade, uh, to evade them. We should not pass the message that because you have technology, you can avoid to have governance. On the contrary, right? And at the same time, I would like to warn that private. That we understand that, that uh, uh, Ronald said at the beginning, we have a problem. We cannot continue the way it is. There is a demand for data that is not ma matched. That is not uh, matched by by the current uh, practice. Uh, nobody, of course, we have a problem. Uh, but and some pet used in a certain way can be improve the situation. But it's also true that some other pet used in some other way might even make the situation, uh, let's say, more exposed, uh, more worse, uh, worse. Um, so I think we should be cautious, and I would like to have a comment also from 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 Andrew. Uh, I see the risk that uh, some private some pet that are used, uh, let's say, in um, to evade governance and policies. Right, uh, have high risk of let's say be detrimental to privacy uh, rather than enhancing privacy. I would like to have a comment from Andrew, in particular, but also from the other speaker. If you also see this risk, because being aware that there is a risk is a very big step towards avoiding to be trapped into it. Thanks, Fabio. Um, thank you. We'll keep those questions. Uh, and I will, uh, we're going to finish up with first Massimo, then Sojin, and Andrew gets the last word. Uh, Massimo, first, any any comments on the que on the questions or the comments that you heard? Any comments from your side, uh, Massimo? Yes, I, I agree with Fabio that uh, it's important uh, to, to, to evaluate, to, good, to have a, a good evaluation of the techniques case by case. We have to evaluate case by case and adopt the, the correct technique, uh, uh, the, the correct privacy technology. In general, I think that uh, about the privacy set intersection is uh, um, a protocol that uh, fits very well with the, uh, the statistical needs because uh, we have uh, many, many, many use cases in which uh, our need is to integrate data that are owned by external parties respect to the national statistic offices. So it's a very important things. And um, in general, I think that the concept of governance and trust are crucial because are in the middle of the, the problem. So we have to, to continue to, um, to invest in these two aspects of the, the governance and the trust in the path. So. Thank you. Thanks, Massimo. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Three things. Uh, I'd like to address that uh, what is considered to be sensitive uh, question. 
So I have uh, been working in healthcare quite a lot and most recently pandemic uh, regarding pathogenic data. So it's a very complex question. And especially in the medical field, it's not so much about nicely structured tabular data. It's that patient information in a tabular format combined with, for example, medical images, uh, pathology images, doctor's notes. So that's what makes it very uh, uh, complex in, in terms of risk assessment. And also the uh, uh, pathogen genomic context, it's not so much that the pathogen genomic data is sensitive when it's combined with the critical metadata, which is key in terms of doing unit input analysis. So when they both of those things get combined, that's where the risk is at. So it's a very complex question. I don't really have an answer to what's sensitive, but I do want to say the existing classification of binary risk, you know, it's safe or not, that's not working. And it's not helpful because it blocks so much possibility from further data sharing. So hence, uh, privacy enhancing technology operate on the continuum of risk, not binary classification of risk. So that's something I, I do want to mention. Um, in terms of who we're working with at WHO, we've been in contact with a few folks at the WHO BioHub. So Dr. Bassi and Iona, I don't know if you, um, but that was a while ago. So I, I'd love to check further on that topic and then get key contacts with this uh, pandemic dedicated group for sure. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I heard comments around five safe. So we're very much in the process of uh, working on this paper. So I, I'd love to follow up and then uh, collaborate and then get other people's insight further. It sounds like there's a, a great amount of work going on in this topic and interest. So it was very nice to hear uh, uh, from you. So I'll follow up on that topic. I made a note in terms of this book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Andrew, last few minutes. Very briefly. Um, so. Uh, not, not a legal definition, but a philosophical definition of sensitive versus not sensitive is when I give you a piece of information, I'm activating every possible decision that you might make that would use or misuse that information, decisions I agree with or disagree with ethically. And so I think whenever you have a, a, a category, a piece of data that could make more accurate decisions you would consider to be ethically misused, um, that's when it starts to fall into the category of being sensitive data along the dimensions. But wrangling that is like, I think, very difficult, which creates that messiness around, around the definition. Um, uh, thank you so much for all the work that your team is doing um, on, on pushing the, the bounds of what pets can be used. Um, I think that your, your perspective on trade-offs is precisely right. Um, and that one of these, these challenges that, that is also difficult to explain, almost like from a public relations standpoint, is that the, the, we're missing a word. When we, when we say use pets to share data, this is not what we're doing, right? In a perfect world, if, if you want to have perfect use without misuse, governors should be able to approve specific uses of information while being able to prevent any other use of information. When I give someone a copy, I activate both, right? And so the whole point of like the aspiration of pets, being able to extract very, very specific answers to very, very specific questions, is this ideal? That, that can solve this problem, but we don't have good language for it yet. So the, that, you know, to, to, to your point, it's just Canada and, and managing kind of the public relations aspect of it. There's a, there's, a, there's a missing terminology. There is a missing education piece that does need to happen. And that, that also, I think, brings us to what, what Fabia said a moment ago, which is they shouldn't have been called privacy enhancing technologies. We have inherited that term. That term is in the air, but they should have been called as governance technologies. And like anything you're using for governance, the governors can decide to use that in positive ways or in negative ways. They can decide to activate uses that are positive or activate uses that are, that are negative. They have a big red button that says yes or no, right? And the, the great thing about so-called privacy and technology is they can increase the fine-grained nature of, of approving specific uses while disapproving all the other uses. But that's still called into the question of who gets to control the button, right? And what are they going to do for? And unfortunately, per Fabio's comment, a variety of organizations, particularly in the private sector, that are actually more interested in misusing information um, are so sort of doing what's called privacy washing, where they're saying, we're using privacy and technology, so it must be great, while they're actually activating the buttons behind the scenes to invade, invade privacy. And that's, like, I think, a major public relations risk for the field as a whole. They could actually take our, you know, from, from Seth's Canada's comments, us in, in the wrong direction in terms of public perception around privacy and technology. So, difficult challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, an applause. Yeah. The 
think we can all agree it's a very interesting topic and we can talk about this for a long time. I know you are, you are you're all sitting here to sprint. Uh, <laughs> very last comment is that if you're interested to keep uh, this discussion going, join us. Right? So we have this pet asking you or someone from your team, get them involved. We are open. Uh, uh, yeah, the PETA lab is a meeting once a week, but asking uh, every two weeks. Yeah. Uh, and you're very welcome to join. So thank, thank you all for coming here. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll discuss more about this next week. Thank you. Thanks. Other than the one. Hello, follow up. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.